James Brown was deeply affected by events in the civil rights movement. And uh, when James Meredith was shot in 1966 uh, to start his march against fear um, in Mississippi, he, James Brown flew to Mississippi to uh, perform a benefit concert. And uh, a lot of civil rights leaders went to Mississippi to finish that march for James Meredith. And uh, James found himself um, motivated and compelled to uh, be a part of a lot of these events. And I think the, that period of the mid to late 1960s affected everyone. And James, uh, he felt he was a leader. He felt he had a role to play. And I believe saw himself as a civil rights leader. And so when these uh, moments, uh, uh, when these events took place, um, I think he felt like it was his time and place to take a leadership role in a, in a, in, in expressing a response, an appropriate response to some of them. And he consistently uh, tried to deliver a message of uh, self-worth, of pride, of dignity, and not to uh, use violence, not to uh, get into despair. Um, it was, you know, to uh, uh, rebuild, to organize, to, 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 to keep, um, keep the pressure on, you know, in the causes. And so James Brown really um, delivered in a lot of ways the same message you were hearing from Martin Luther King uh, in public. And in terms of the self-reliance, he was delivering the same message that Malcolm X had been delivering in terms of, you know, you take your destiny into your own hands. So James Brown was very shrewd in, in the way he navigated um, the in increasing uh, tension and, and pressure and danger of the civil rights movement and uh, kind of maintained the position as a leader in a subtle way uh, while he was an entertainer. James had a rather enigmatic relationship with the blues. James played music that was all about getting out of the impoverished, really uh, uh, lost place that he came from, right? His mother had left him, his father had left him, he was raised in a brothel, he was in, a, in, a, in the most unstable place he could be. And so James's music was determined to move forward, move ahead, move past uh, these trials and into something forward. And um, to a lot of folks at that time, the blues represented uh, this statement of historical memory that goes all the way back to the suffering of slavery. And as far as a survival mechanism, the blues helped black people survive some of the worst trials you, know, you can imagine. Um, at this moment of the 60s, people were saying it's time for uh, something looking forward something fresh, something that, that, is, that is the next step, the next phase. And James Brown positioned himself at the front of that, of that force of new sound, this new spirit, this new energy, and he was going to move ahead. And one thing that he sort of, he didn't buy into was the idea of having songs that had a, a double meaning or a, a deliberate meaning that went around in circles. Uh, about what he said. Uh, when he said, please, 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 he was begging. He was begging. Sometimes you can't mince your words. If you, if you got to beg for some of that, you got to beg. You got to lay it all out. And so that was his approach. And he came up around great rhythm and blues performers. He understood the rhythm and blues tradition of, um, you know, celebrating life and movement and sensuality and dance and all these, you know, wonderful survival mechanisms that were in the black community to help people, you know, get through the work week, help people get through the day, get through their lives. Um, but he, he's, he, didn't, he didn't buy into that idea that you should say one thing and mean another thing. And so when, he, when, it, when the time had come for him to step forward and say he's got a new sound, Papa's got a brand new bag, when it was time for him to you know, deal with sort of a larger philosophy of society, it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl. He's breaking these things down in as direct a fashion as he can. And as, as 
things unfolded in the 1960s, the circumstances were more blatant, more bold, more direct. You had raw confrontations with power uh, at every step in the anti-war movement, in the, in the uh, basically racial conflict. It had gone from civil rights to black power and a more direct form of racial conflict. And so James Brown's music and his style fit right into that discourse. That discourse, the, the rhetoric, the period of, of rhetoric and talking around the circles had passed. It was time to tell it like it is. And James Brown was right there on top of it because that's the way he operated. James Brown was a staunch capitalist. He saw uh, the opportunities in American society. He saw that they were, they existed for people that were willing to drive themselves and others enough uh, to where you could get uh, where you want to go. And um, he, he lived by that philosophy. Now, uh, the civil rights movement and uh, the black power movement that uh, was connected to it, uh, James Brown saw that as an opportunity for him to allow others to have their opportunities in this American system. So uh, in that respect, it should not come as a surprise that James Brown would endorse a Republican for president, that he would see that you know, individualism and individual success is uh, the makeup of what uh, you know, built this country in a, in a certain context. And James Brown was with that. Uh, so he didn't see his um, support for civil rights causes and this and that and the other as necessarily connected to some larger uh, movement for social change. He saw it as, uh, as a means for giving everyone an opportunity in this American system. Um, but James Brown's personal style was rooted in uh, his upbringing, which was this special little space in the middle of Jim Crow where black people were still uh, celebrated and affirmed in their own way. And so James Brown uh, never really changed in terms of putting on the airs of sophistication that most upwardly mobile people would, uh, would try to assume. And so he sort of had this, um, this, this kind of contradiction in place where he identified with uh, what he would say with the ghetto. He identified with you know working class people. He identified with you know the people that were struggling because he he saw them as having the potential to do what he did in the American system. Other people perhaps were struggling to change that system entirely. Uh, James wanted to make sure people had more opportunities in that system. And, you know, he's not alone in having that perspective, but he's very special in the way he kind of had this uh, notion of upward mobility, but he was steadfast in his uh, sense of identity and how that was not something that would be compromised in the process. James Brown's revolution in rhythm uh, the use of the one, the, the use, of, the approach to making music that is rhythm based, where you get the beat down first, then you get the melody together, was a radical departure for American popular music. Um, and that was the key ingredient for making funk music. It was called soul at that time, good funky soul music. Uh, the musicians understood what was happening. They were put. They were putting more emphasis on the one, on that downbeat, putting it up where it's supposed to be down, and the sort of expectations of down. And you get up, you get a whole different percolation in the rhythm. Uh, James brought that funk, and people heard that around the world. They heard it in Jamaica. They were listening to, to ska and calypso and kind of smoother stuff uh, in Jamaica. They heard that downbeat, that one, that funk and that influenced a lot of Jamaican musicians to make some more riff heavy, bass heavy, thumping, uh, heartbeat pulsing music that became known as reggae music. 
and even Bob Marley will talk about it. Uh, he talks about how James Brown was part of the transformation uh, from ska to rock steady. Um, Fela Kuti was the same way. He was just into Afro pop and everywhere up and down the West African coast uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, it was about soul music and James Brown. And people in, uh, in particularly in these countries that had just been liberated from you know colonized rule these were folks that felt their conscious you know black identity and yet they still wanted to be modern and here comes this music from this black man that is as now as can be and yet it's speaking to them uh, in this way that is touching on some primal ancient ways of making music that have always sort of worked and so James Brown enamored himself to uh, he, he moved the world of music. He made dance music change all around the world. Well, I think of James Brown as soul brother number one because he belonged to the people and yet he was the number one among the people. And that way we could all be down for James Brown and we down for being black and proud. And yet, we, so we were followers, but we were among him in that way. Um, Godfather of Soul implies that he's the, on the throne as the mobster that, that, that lets people have this. And that worked well with uh, people later on, like Hammer that did the whole thing with him. Godfather, Godfather, you know, let us, you know, let us anoint us and that type of thing. And that, that seemed ceremonial, but I like the, the functional aspect of being soul brother number one. Because that, because you, because you feel like you can go and and slap five and shake hands with Soul Brother Number One, Godfather Soul. You need to bow down uh, to that. But you felt both with James Brown. You felt like you could, you know, you wanted to walk up and, and embrace him and meet him and speak to him. But you also revered him deeply.